Well, th thank you, Bill, uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I don't know that I'm going to be able to outdo that. Um, but uh, first, I want to say, uh, uh, like I think many of the folks in the room here today, I I'm proud to be a friend of Bill. Um, I, I know uh, a lot of folks in this room are old friends of Bill's, uh, and I know many of you also are new friends of Bill's, and I'm one of the new ones. When Bill moved down to Princeton about two years ago, we were fortunate enough to meet early on and, and realize that we were uh, kind of common travelers and, and had a lot in common, and uh, it's been a uh, pleasure, uh, Bill, to work with you on this uh, event. And the, uh, some of the genesis of this was after Sandy, as we sat around, as I think probably a lot of folks in this room did, saying, you know, well, what can we do about this? How do we stop this from happening again? And, uh, you know, I think most folks, myself included, are more inclined to sit around and gnash our teeth and pull our hair. That's why I have so little left. Uh, Bill is one of those rare folks who uh, is really has an ability to energize people and move them to action. And uh, when Bill called me and after months of our talking about we should do something like Nietzsche, um, he called me up probably about a month and a half, two months ago and said, we're going. I've booked the Kennedy Library. This event's going to happen. We need to make it happen. Let's get going. And um, uh, uh, Dwayne Morris, uh, is proud to support uh, Bill and Nietzsche in this effort uh, to really develop the um, advocacy, the coordinated, concerted advocacy uh, across the board of industries, regions, uh, and partisan groups. Because we all know, those in the room, I think what most of us are true believers uh, in understanding the need to do something here. This group doesn't really need to be convinced of the need, to, need for action. but. Uh, as Bill, I think, properly put his finger you know, right on the issue. Uh, there's a sense of fatalism that we all have, that, well, it can't be done. And you look at what we just went through with the sequestration and what goes on in Washington and the difficulties that our president has had and that the Congress has in simply moving forward. Um, but rather than uh, sitting in our houses and saying what's going to happen, uh, it really is incumbent and, and Bill's call to action is, 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 is absolutely on point. It's really incumbent on, uh, on each and every one of us in whatever walk of life we find ourselves in, whether we're government official, uh, elected official, um, in business, in labor, in academia, uh, to really bring to bear the sort of uh, energy and commitment uh, to move forward. And the, the goal here, and Dwayne Moore, and I think um, I, I'm very fortunate uh, to have uh, partners in my firm who see the value in taking a lead and uh, driving the issue and driving the, sp the, the, the call uh, and, and, and to advocate for the sort of funding that needs to be uh, put in place. Um, we've got um, a ton of local action going on and we're going to hear about that later on today. Um, the, uh, the, the, the question is, are we going to come up with the political will and the capital to make these plans a reality? And I think a very important person in uh, helping convince those who are not yet convinced that it really is time is our morning uh, keynote speaker, Cynthia Rosenzweig. And it's, it's my, really my, my honor to have the opportunity to, to introduce Cynthia. Um, Cynthia really is um, probably the, lead, the leading person uh, in the field of uh, climate change and in particularly the impact of climate change. Um, and I know a lot of her work has been uh, in, the, in the urban area lately, but a lot of her work has, she's really looked at these issues, um, I think, um, across the country. Um, and, and perhaps from a political perspective, uh, knowing where the opposition to federal funding comes from these days, some of her most important work may, may involve uh, her research that she's done in the past in the field of climate change in agriculture and the areas where not our coastal areas. Because at the end of the day, we have to, uh, we, we have to convince the Congress that there is a need for, for all of us to support this effort. Cynthia is um, a uh, currently senior research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Um, so it's great to have a, uh, a rocket scientist 
uh, uh, here to, to address us on the issue. Um, she has a bachelor's and uh, her master's degrees uh, from uh, the great uh, uh, University of New Jersey, also known as Rutgers University Cook College. Uh, she received her PhD from uh, the great University of Massachusetts. So uh, she kind of had the perfect background for Bill, a guy from Massachusetts, and me, a guy from New Jersey. Um, at, at NASA, Cynthia's uh, job is to head the, uh, cl uh, the climate impact group uh, at, at NASA. Uh, she uh, co-chaired the New York City panel on climate change, um, and she has uh, uh, co-chaired numerous uh, panels and groups that have formed uh, to study these issues. I know she's been very involved both in uh, Mayor Bloomberg's very progressive uh, uh, planning for the city of New York, as well as uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, very progressive planning uh, for the state of New York. And, and I think uh, those two uh, f officials uh, really are um, going to be, uh, they are leaders in exactly the issue that we're talking about here today. Cynthia is one of really their key people that they have leaned on. Um, and uh, I think when you put together uh, Cynthia's body of work, um, Nature probably s said it best, the publication Nature, when they named her last year to uh, their uh, 10 people who mattered in 2012. Uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig matters a great deal in this area. She's going to continue to matter a great deal in this area. And it's my distinct pl pleasure and privilege to introduce her this morning uh, to really help us understand exactly what it is that we confront. Thank you very much. Cynthia. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank Bill Golden and the National Institute for Coastal and Harbor Infrastructure uh, for inviting me to, um, to speak today. Um, while the focus of today's symposium is on our national, um, uh, the US national needs, in regard to coastal infrastructure and climate change. Our, um, our thoughts still um, also go out to the um, people in the Philippines with the loss of life and livelihoods that they have just have experienced from the strength of the ty typhoon there. That sets the larger context of what we do in the United States also matters internationally and the leadership that we can provide here is very important um, internationally as well. So today, I want to talk about the climate challenges for coastal zones. And I'm going to particularly share lessons from New York City and Hurricane Sandy. all set up. <laughs> well, you and I checked it, right? <laughs> it's very hard. It's hard to have a NASA scientist talk without um, their PowerPoints. <laughs> but if I have to, I will. So I can go get my sticky. While we're addressing this uh, technical uh, issue, I would also like to uh, focus on another participant today. Uh, the Boston New England Marine Trades Council is here in force today. Uh, when we talk about this being a first in the nation meeting, uh, engineers have gotten together, uh, government officials have gotten together, labor has gotten together, uh, private sector interests like insurance and banking uh, have gotten together, but I think it is a rare occasion where everyone has gotten together at the same time. And it's going to be, as uh, Paul mentioned, we need to build uh, a coalition that has political muscle. And that muscle is going to come at, at, in many different ways, but I'm very grateful that 
we have organized labor uh, supporting us here today and hopefully supporting uh, this whole effort uh, as we move forward. Very important component of this coalition. Uh, and with regard to the Philippines, I, I had meant to say something about this earlier. Uh, it is a very serious situation in the Philippines. I don't know if, if you've kept up with this, but uh, the Philippines have lost uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of lives uh, as a result of the impact of this typhoon. And if we look at what's happening around the world, if we look at Katrina, if we look at Sandy, if we look at uh, Holland that had uh, a huge northeaster in late uh, October that was not a hurricane, but uh, one that, that uh, definitely was an extreme weather event. Uh, these storms are coming, and uh, they're coming with greater ferocity and greater regularity. And I think this is also something that's going to move us forward. Uh, the, each one is a reminder that we have not uh, put together a national policy to address these issues. And each one is going to uh, propel this organization uh, and energize this organization. So with that said, right. uh, Dr. Rosenzweig. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll see if this works. All right, here we go. Let's see if it's serious. Yes. Yeah. All right, here's the outline. Um, first, what are the climate change challenges in coastal zones? There's um, sort of a lot of hand-waving about that, but what are those challenges really? Um, then I want to turn to how New York City has organized its adaptation process. The key, the key operative word there is process. Adaptation is a process. It is not a one time, we're going to do one thing and that's going to be it and we're going to be all set and protected. Um, then I'll turn specifically to, um, to responding to Hurricane Sandy uh, in New York City and then um, end with Hurricane Sandy as a tipping point. In climate science, we have um, this concept of tipping points, which is in a physical process that builds up slowly over time, reaches a threshold, and then has rapid acceleration after that tipping point. And um, I, I really believe, and I think that um, this, um, this symposium today is showing that Hurricane Sandy is being a tipping point in the response to climate change as well. So, uh, the, um, uh, the, this is the, some findings from the draft national climate assessment on the coastal zones. And um, um, what's important is that uh, this report is coming out, uh, is due to come out next March. And for the, uh, it's, there have been um, two or three other national assessments, but it's, it's very important that there is a national view on what are the major risks of climate change and how, and pathways for adaptation nationally. And these, these are the key findings on the coastal zone that are, that are, um, uh, com that are, will be more or less like this um, as, they, uh, as, they, as it goes through the uh, final review processes. So here they are. Coastal zones are increasingly vulnerable to higher sea levels and storm surges, inland flooding, and other climate-related changes. What, why do we care about this? We care about this because of what's in the second bullet that there is increase, that this increases exposure of important assets, just as Bill and Paul and um, Kurt Spaulding have, have been sharing with us uh, this morning. Exposure of important assets, such as the ports, tourism, fishing sites, in already vulnerable coastal locations. And this threatens to disrupt economic activity. The final point is that that these coastal vulnerabilities affect the people who live in the coastal zones and that their livelihoods are threatened so that 